The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You know how people say, well, God understands why I complained. He didn't make you like that. The world did. God did not teach us how to complain. The world did. God did not teach us how to criticize. The world did. God did not teach us how to escape. The world did. God didn't teach us most of what we do in this world. The world did. Being a good steward is with those things that the Lord has taught us or we committed to them. Or do we set those things aside to practice the ways of the world? This distinction is a rotten root under most nations, and it's taking its toll. You guys remember the hot storm story, the dream I told you guys about, the hot storm? That will burn away all the garbage in people's foundations because nothing else would remove it. A continual degrading, there were giants protecting the garbage in a person's life. And what that garbage is, just to give you a brief summary, I found myself in a place and there were these homes that were half wood, half brick. Some had more brick than wood, some had more wood than brick. I was told to go down into the basement to take out the trash, and it was a lot of trash. So in this one place, I went down there, down these spiral steps. I get down to the bottom, and I'm picking up trash, and I walk through this, you know, I'm picking up trash in a basement, and they, all of them had little windows in them. And uh, as I'm picking up trash, I reach this point where it's like a little doorway, and I saw something sitting at a table in the back. When this thing saw me, it raised up and it was huge. And in that dream, I was scared to death. I dropped the trash, took off running, and I said, I can't get the trash out of the basement. There were giants protecting the trash. And something was communicating to me the whole time. I said, okay, I'll send a storm. It'll burn the trash. So tell the people, maintain what they have. Don't add any more trash in their foundations. The interpretation, oh, by the way, when, when I did that, when I was running away from this giant, he started chasing me. So as I was running across this bridge away from all these little houses, I saw clouds. And they were hot, they were flaming. And when this giant behind me saw the clouds, he was scared to death. I ran into it, it was hot. I could perceive it was hot. It didn't burn me, but it, he was terrified. The storm passed over all these houses made of wood and stone. After it finished, I could see all the houses all over the place, all the wood, all the trash. Anything that was not stone was gone. Some houses crumbled because their entire foundation was too much wood, false materials. Some houses, they had their foundation, but the top that was built atop them, some of that did not stay. There were a couple of houses that were solid stone. The storm burnt all the trash. You know what the trash is? As we are raised in this world, all of us come from different backgrounds. We're raised in very different ways. And while somebody's raising us, we accumulate a foundation. We start with foundation of what we think is real, what we think is wholesome, what we think is true, and what we think is right. In that dream, the Lord was communicating to me that all of us have incorrect things in our foundation. If you think about it, there's one Holy Spirit, there's one Father, one Christ. How can anybody argue when there's only one Father, one Holy Spirit, one Christ? How can anybody disagree with a scripture when it came from one source? That means we don't know the truth. That means in our foundation, we're leaning against or utilizing things that we were raised up with that are not of the Lord. And it's not like anybody can teach a person enough to get rid of that stuff out of their foundation. So a storm must come. A storm that will burn up everything that is not of the living God that's in our foundations. It must be burned. That was the garbage. The garbage in the foundation were the worldly things we have learned and accepted as truth. Mixing it with the Holy Word of God. Having all these different uh, viewpoints, opinions, religions, whatever the case is. All of it's going to be burnt. And the only thing that's going to be left is the Word of God. There'll be no more confusion. Even in the Bible, it says that one language is going to be returned back to the inhabitants of the earth. So we'll all speak one language. A language of truth. No ambiguity. No worldly things, right? No made-up things. No imaginative talk. None of that stuff. It'll be a pure word. And we'll speak a pure language. One language. Right now, that's not what we speak. Why? Because of our backgrounds and cultures. Because of how we're raised. There are people out there that are racist right now because they were raised racist. And for them... That's just the way it is. You can't remove that. I can't either. There's some people out there who don't like a certain type of person. 
because they were raised that way. There are people who have had vicious people in their past. And so when they meet people like that in their future, of course they're going to recoil. They still love the Lord. It's just that there are a lot of falsehoods in our foundations. And the Lord will remove that. He said he would do that himself. When he does, our vision will be single. Until that time, all of us have to be good stewards over the Word of God and make that distinction between the Word of God and the world. And that's not as easy as you think. Because the world teaches this junk in your foundation will not allow you, it won't allow you to speak a pure word. You won't do it. It fights against your faith, your belief as a whole. And when that happens, you exercise no authority. If you have authority on this earth, it came from the Most High, and it must be exercised as the Most High has given it to you. If God gave you authority, but you're instructed by somebody on earth who does not know about that authority, then you're not going to be utilizing the authority of the living God in the earth, which is your God-given authority on the earth. Do you all see that? Listen, I can't sit here and say I have authority over spirits utilizing man's methods. That's not going to work. God has given us a way, but people, lot, lots of people have chosen to use man's ways, not God's ways. God's ways that he gave us came through Christ. They also came through the apostles. They replicated exactly what Christ did. Even the prophets did the exact same thing. They followed the instruction of the Most High. The same thing they did back then existed during the time of Christ and exists today. But then man has written up his own set of rules. And I know partially I know the reason why. Only because I read some things and found out about some historical truths of people. And I'll, I'll give you one thing. There was an old, let's call him a preacher, who tried to cast out a demon. It didn't work. In fact, he was sickened during that session because he was trying to operate by what he read out of the Word of God. And it didn't work for him immediately. So when it didn't work, he said, well, there must be a mistake. So he came up with a set of methods. He bought that before council. The council approved those methods. They tried out those methods, printed those books. They reside in a library. And people do practice them to this day. It is not what Jesus taught us. It's what man did because of their lack of faith. In 2016, some letters were written to explain why those were put in the library in the first place. And one of the reasons was it was very difficult for people back then to have faith in the right direction because governmental powers often manipulated how people interpreted the word. And if you did not interpret the word as per the government said it was to be interpreted, you could be killed. See, back then, the government governed your faith. It wasn't like today. Today, they have separation of church and state for that very reason. So that government cannot tell you how to worship and who to worship. That's why they did that. It just went haywire on them. Rules work in a moral society. Rules will not work in hell. Why? Because everybody's going to try and sidestep the rules. They're going to make amendments. They're going to excuse themselves. They have no moral uprightness about them. So they don't desire to uphold anything moral but to sidestep it. Democracy does not work in an immoral society. Democracy works in a moral society. And we have degraded much. Anyway, even today when people go through procedures of doing things, it's because they themselves are full of ego and pride. And God does resist the proud. If I were proud and try to rebuke anything, it would not work. Because I'd be rebuked by the living God. So how can I rebuke something? If God is rebuking me, and if I have pride in me, I'm not standing against any darkness because darkness is full of pride. How can I rebuke darkness, which is full of pride, if I am prideful about it? That means I'm utilizing a piece of darkness to rebuke darkness. That doesn't work. Repetitious sayings you guys have heard over and over again. You know why that ends up being effective to a degree? It's one of the reasons why they wrote what they wrote in the libraries. It's because the first few times a person is not listening to what they're saying. And when they continue to say it, it finally sinks in. And when it sinks in, it recalls Christ. Then after a while, the person, they submit to Christ and his authority in that situation. And at that point, they are empowered. Until that point, they're full of pride, thinking that they're doing it, that they can do it, right? A, a, a secret in my life, I don't believe that I can do anything. But I know that Christ can do all things. I don't have to believe I can do it because I know that Christ can do it. If somebody ever uses that, things will change in your life almost immediately. Ego, what is that? I'll always take the low seat. The world scrambles to take the high seat. They scramble to be right over one another. Can't you see that all over the world? Everybody's trying to be right. You live in a world where everybody is right. And this is the result. 
of everybody being right. Much division. Those are satanic practices. That's exactly what Satan did when he thought he was right in ascending his throne above the living gods. And like lightning, he fell, which means very quickly. Didn't take a thousand years, it was instantaneous. When we're not prideful and we take that low seat, one of the first things we begin to look up to is our father, realizing what we are, realizing what our foe is. For example, a demon. In truth, a demon is much stronger than I am. They know the spiritual realm, right? They know it well, but they don't have the blood. The only reason they can't get to us is because God said no. That's the only reason. It's not because of what we're doing. It's because of Christ, because Jesus said no. You remember when the disciples got happy? They said, oh, all spirits are subject unto us. They got happy. Jesus said, uh, don't get happy about that, but be happy that your name is written in the book of life. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But they were excited. They were, they were just taken back because they said, all spirits are subject unto us. Ego trying to step back into them as though they had some authority over the demons. Jesus kind of set that straight. He said, instead of getting excited about that, be thankful that your names are written in the book of life. Because if their names were not written in the book of life, they would have no authority, not over those spirits. So I want you to know something. You have authority over spirits because of Christ, not because of yourselves. As far as earthly authority, God has given you dominion, which by the way, if you're not careful, you're going to misuse it. We were talking about faith. When you pray for something, how you prepare yourself to receive. If you prayed for a new place, how you must take the steps when you do that, you're believing. But you're also exercising authority, your God-given authority, which is to have dominion over the earth. You're also applying principles. Did you guys know that darkness attracts darkness? Now, the righteous will attract darkness, but darkness really attracts darkness. Did you guys know it's a constant war going on around you, right? It's happening all around you. When you don't take steps towards faith, you're already operating by a worldly standard that was influenced by spirits of darkness. Anything you don't do by biblical standards, you're doing by what was established in the world, not by the living God, but by those who oppose God's authority, the one who will resist the gospel, the adversary. But when you operate by God's word, being a good steward, that means, listen, never taking for granted where you are, what you have, and what the conditions are. Let me make that clear. How many of you have had a complaint about where you live in the last week? You can be honest here. Most people have. Most people have said, oh, this is killing me. How many people said that? Oh, this is killing me. Now, that those are just words, right? They are. They're just words. Isn't that what people say? Oh, it's just words. No, oh, it's a complaint is what that is. In fact, when you speak something, you've agreed with whatever it was you spoke for. Because with every word, you're aligning yourself with the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. Every word that comes out of your mouth aligns you with a kingdom. And whatever kingdom you align yourself with, you're going to have the results of. Your speech is everything. That's why the word says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Why? Because every word you speak, you're aligning yourself with one of two kingdoms. And if you know that and you do it anyway, and the Lord loves you, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. That means you're going to walk around wounded because you got spanked and the Lord loves you and he does not want to lose you to darkness. And so you have to be disciplined on a brand new level. Now that's not mean. That's for a person who doesn't quite believe in the negative results of serving darkness, which is eternal separation from all light, all love. Nobody wants that. Even the demons don't want that. They're terrified of hell. Did you know that? Demons are not in hell throwing a party. They are terrified of hell. That's why the book of Enoch is so extraordinary. Believe me when I tell you they're not having a party. That place gives them the jitters. And Jesus is the one that's going to send them there. He is the one that has the authority that will send them there. Jesus is. That's why when he approached that person that was throwing himself to and fro, those demons within that person said, What have we to do with thee, thou son of man? Have you come to judge us, to, give, to throw us into hell before the time? Jesus is like the warden, and they were terrified. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus, because he's the one that's going to give them their eternal sins. Demons didn't want anything to do with the disciples either, or the apostles at the time. They did not. Why? Because they dwelled in Christ, and God's spirit was in them. Demons want nothing to do with anybody who is a vessel where Christ does dwell. But they can resist a person of flesh. 
always, because a person of flesh will distort their God-given authorities. God gave you dominion over things that was established at the beginning. Then that whole process was interrupted and perverted by Satan. When Jesus came, he restored it. If we listen to him, but something has happened. Procedures of people, of men, of little to no faith. They have added their two cents into it. You know what happens when you add water to soda? Does anybody know? If you keep adding water to soda, what's going to happen? It'll lose its punch, won't it? And if you continue to have water to it, you water that down. It's going to have no kick. Before you know it, it has no potency. Before you know it, it has no flavor. Only a remnant of the flavor it once had. Only a remnant of the punch it once had. That's precisely what's happening with the Word of God. The more people add two cents to what Jesus has already said, it waters it down in a very bad way. Then you end up with more politics than the Holy Word of God. Haven't you guys seen that in action? Somebody says something, quote it out of the Bible. Why did that person say that? A quote out of the Bible. We get that all the time in COT. People write and say, that's not in the Bible. Sure it is. You point them to the scripture, they can't believe it. Well, it must be the Mandela effect because it wasn't in there when I was young. That's what they'll say. Any excuse to go around what's in the word of God. But the truth is, sometimes we have ways about ourselves we're not willing to give up. We're not. If you're a loving person, you do that because you feel a loss of security doing something a brand new way. You have no trust in it. Imagine a mouse. He's cornered by a cat inside a hole of a tree. Not much space, but at least he's alive because he knows the cat's out there. Another little marsupial comes up to him and says, Hey, when the cat turns, let's run out of this protected area around the back of the tree and you'll be free forever. The one little marsupial says, How so? Well, if you run behind the tree, it's a hole that will bring you to a whole other land that the cat can't come in because he can't fit through the hole. So guess what? If that were true, the one marsupial that found that little tiny area, a place of safety, and the only place it knows away from certain danger, it's going to be based on faith, whether he finds true freedom or not. Folks, listen to me. Because if it were true, if it were a hole behind the tree that would take that little marsupial down to a place where cats cannot go, where he could live out his life in freedom, he'd have a big decision, but he wouldn't understand how big. You see, if he stays in that little cubby hole, which feels safe for the moment, because a cat will surely kill him if he comes out, and he knows that in this tree hole, the cat cannot get him, but he has no food. He can't even stretch his legs. And another one comes around and says, hey, I know a place. And if you just can just run around with me when the cat turns his back or run down through this hole, you'll be free forever. The one that's in that corner, he's never seen that hole. All he knows is that somebody came up and told him that you can be free forever. So what's going to go through the first marsupial's mind? He's going to say, wait a minute, what if this person is not telling the truth? What if they have it wrong and I run out of this protected area? I'm not doing too bad right? I'm alive, I'm starving, I'm thirsty, I'm scared to death, but I'm not doing too bad. But I would have to abandon my place of safety, my place of certain safety to follow something I don't know about and to follow someone I never met before. I don't know if he's telling me the truth or not. So another marsupial comes around and tells him the same thing. Now there's two and he still has the same choice. And then three come around, and then four come around, then five come around, then six come around, then seven comes around, then eight, and they keep coming and they keep telling him, why don't you come come with us? There's a hole, so can you imagine about 50, 50 other little creatures coming up, telling this one smashed up in a hole? You would think by weight of the volume, of the sheer number of folks who told him that they would abandon their place of comfort and take a step of faith. No, it doesn't work that way sometimes. And do you know what happens if that little fella stays in the hole of that tree? Do you know what happens? His fate is left up to the cat. He could have had freedom, but he's trying to hide from an enemy he can see. And he found a place of safety. And instead of taking a step by faith, he's going to stay in that hole and rot. You know what happens at the end? If he finally decides to listen, but nobody's coming back to tell him exactly where it is, he's going to die. Do you know that same thing is going to happen in the world? There's going to be a time when it's too late. And because people have no other choice, they're going to say, I'll listen, because they have no other choice. And it will be too late. You know what God is doing right now? Messenger after messenger is coming at folks with the word of God, not with their own sayings, with the Bible. 
They're saying, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Hey, look what God said. Hey, we can have this and we can have that. And all we have to do is give up this and give up our comforts, right? Not knowing that to give up your space in that tree, this tiny where you can't even stretch out your legs, to give up that space is not giving up a thing. That's what people don't, that's what the little marsupial didn't understand. He wouldn't be giving up anything. He would be actually freeing himself from being crunched up in a hole and cut off from all supplies. But it takes faith. Do you all see that? It takes faith. Faith in what? Faith in the message. Had that marsupial had the tiniest bit of faith in the message, he would have came to his senses. He would have said, you know what? This little hole I'm in, it's not going to support me forever, is it? No. I can't get any food while I'm in this little hole, can I? No. So it's actually deliverance, isn't it? Yes. Well, let me go. Suppose there were two more soupils in there. This is the human case. Suppose there are a bunch of little mice in the hole of a tree. A bunch. And one little mouse comes around the corner and says, Hey guys, I know where there's a hole. Here's what happens. The one steps out on faith, follows the first little mouse. They never see him again. They never see him again. Another mouse comes around after a certain time and he gives the same message. Then another gives another message. So they keep hearing the message. But everyone that steps out, they leave all the rest of them in the hole of the tree. They don't see them again. They're not coming back to that hole in the tree unless they are a messenger. Nobody who is free from that little cubby hole in the tree, this hiding and cowering away from certain death, once they run around and find absolute freedom, the only reason they will come back is to be a messenger, to carry a message. They're never going back to that hole in that tree to dwell with those who were stuck there. That hole in that tree is the world. And in the world, you find comfort, you find safety, you get into your routine. Sometimes things work, sometimes things do not. But then there's the message of faith, a message that your creator has a different way, but it cannot be proven to you. You cannot prove that. No one can prove to a mouse in a cubby hole of a tree, but in the back of the tree, there's another cubby hole, another hole that leads to absolute freedom that no cat can fit in. You can't prove that. There's only one way to absolutely prove that. You know what way that is? Is if one of those mice step up by faith and go see it for themselves. That's the only way it can be proven. You want to know something? No one can prove to you the salvation of the Lord. Unless one steps out on faith, experiences the salvation of the Lord, and will come back to the place he left as a messenger to tell those he left, you don't have to be stuck in this spot. You know what the Bible says? You know what it says in Revelation? That the place you have come from, I'm paraphrasing now, but the place you have come from when you were saved, that's your ministry. People ask, well, what is my calling? God has already told us what the calling is. I'm going to show you guys that scripture so bad, but I know if I do, you won't read Revelation. It's in the letter to the seven churches. If you read the letters to the seven churches, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that the place, that condition you were in when you were saved, is the condition you are never to abandon that place. You're to go back to that place and minister to those in that place because you're familiar with that place. That place you came from, that awful situation you were in when you were saved. You're not to abandon that. How many did not know that? And if you read those letters to the seven churches, you're going to find it. Think of that place, that little cubby hole in a tree for the little tiny marsupial, right? Which, by the way, is not a mouse, but that little tiny cubby hole in the tree, that place of safety. You're familiar with that place. You know where you came from. You know what your life was. What do you ask the Lord to save you from all of that? You know what the breakdown was. You know what our problem is? We try to act like we never came from that place. We really try to cover that over. In other words, we're a little bitty mouse that walks out of that little tiny cubby hole, gets back to the other hole and says, well, I was never in that cubby hole. We try to disassociate ourselves with the place we were saved from because of trauma. A lot of the world teaches you to forget those places. That's not what your father says. That's what the world says. And you have to ask yourself, why do people get hung up on small things? Because they've never overcome the first thing. That was your first experience with deliverance. Because you didn't think you would make it out. You likely did not know what salvation would deliver you from. Somehow you knew you wanted to be saved. You didn't know how it was going to work. But you are not in the place you were saved from. But others are. And you know all about those others, don't you? You know what we often try to do? We try to go to somebody else's place that they left from and go and minister to somebody else. We pick and choose. We don't want to go back to the spot we came out of. We want to go to somebody else's spot. 
much more appealing, right? You may not know this, you're anointed to talk to the same individuals who are in your predicament. So in essence, you're anointed to talk to those who've been walking behind you. You know what? If that is true, then you have, there has to be a way to prove that. If that's an absolute statement, if you're anointed to talk to those who came from the same place you did, then that means those people that came from the same place you did have already heard you. If you're anointed to do that, if you're empowered to do that, if you're blessed to do that, they've heard you. That means they hear you like they hear no one else. That's what it means. They already heard you. So there has to be a way to prove that. Oh, there is. See, all too often, we pick and choose who we'd like to help. If you are washed by the blood of the Lamb, then you are ambassadors to Christ, which means you're able to exercise the authorities of the kingdom in this earth. That's not a joke. That authority can be usurped if you're not utilizing the authority by the blood of the Lamb. A lot of people use that by way of convenience. You remember when the disciples said, they, um, they said, well, uh, Lord, people are casting out demons by your name and we don't even know them. You know what Jesus said? You know what he said? Basically, he said, well, if they're not against us, you know, leave them alone. They're not against us. They're not speaking anything crazy about my name. You know, there you are. They're doing work for the kingdom. So God works. But Jesus also told us something else about those who will be condemned in the end, how they cast out demons in his name, how they preached in his name. So you see, some people have, they've gotten used to utilizing the name of Jesus for selfish works, right? they don't belong to Christ. Listen to me, which means by his name, they're utilizing his authority. But in the end, Jesus will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, that, that is a scary thought, which means you can have a person right now that seems righteous. Listen to me, folks. Don't look at the other person. Look within yourselves. When I say what I say, don't look at somebody else. Look within yourselves. That means there are people out there that say they're Christians. They act like Christians. They look like Christians. They live like Christians. They may preach like Christians, right? They may do things with authority in Christ, but Christ does not know them. You hear me? So they're utilizing his name to cast out demons. They're utilizing his name by his authority established. In his name, they're doing things. But in the end, the Lord will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So how can a person who is a Christian in this world, how can a person who can cast out demons in the name of Jesus, who can preach in the name of Jesus and be effective doing so, how can Jesus reject them? He gave us an explanation. I'll give you the first hint. Jesus told us what the Father accepts as pure and faultless religion. Religion is something you believe in. He said to take care of the widow, to feed the hungry. These are works of the heart, not lip service. These are works of the heart, not tearing a person down. These are works of the heart, not being right. These are works of the heart. The folks that stood before Christ and said, we preached in your name, they're bragging about what they did right. The folks that stood before Christ and said, we cast out demons in your name, they're bragging about their procedures. And Jesus will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you because you did not visit me in prison. You didn't give me something to drink when I was thirsty. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. They're going to say, well, when do we see you in prison? When do we see you thirsty? When do we see you hungry? When do we see you in these conditions? And Jesus will say, what you have done to the least of these, you have done unto me. The least of these? Who was he referring to? That's the key. That, that's one of the keys there. In the canal Greek, it says something expansive. In other words, what you have done, what you do to the worst of anybody out there, done unto the Lord because all of your actions are reflective of the kingdom. An ambassador acts in the stead of its king and whatever you do to someone, whatever you render to someone, Christ is the recipient of those doings from you. That's hard for people to understand, but if they could understand this, they would stop in their tracks at those things they do. You know when Jesus said, love your enemy as yourself, remember we have that discussion, love your enemy as yourself. If you do something to your enemy, it's not good. You have rendered that unto the Lord. See, the Bible says, do all things unto men as you would do unto the Lord. Think about it. Why would he ever say that? Because if you are an ambassador to Christ and you're walking around in this earth, you're doing things in the stead of Jesus. Do you know what it is to do something in someone's name at the time what that meant? That meant to do something in the stead, in the place of the one whose names you represent. Think about that. If you're living your life, you're doing everything in the place of Jesus. That means your representation of Christ is your life. Not when you put on the show, not when you project it, not when people are watching, but always. And that's a scary thought, isn't it? It's a heavy thought. 
right? When you say, oh, I just need a moment to myself, you're still representing Christ so long as you breathe because you're washed by the blood of the Lamb unless you remove that blood off your bodies. That blood is not on there for a few seconds and it goes away while you take a break and then comes back. And that's something we don't really think of. Now, God knows how crazy we are. And thank God for the blood of the Lamb because we all blew that before it ever got started. But when you learn something like that, who would not aspire to become exactly what the Lord is calling us to be? When you understand something like that, can you stay the way you are? I can't because it brings on new convictions. You know, somebody asked me one time, they said, well, what do you think the difference between the wheat and the tares really is? I said, a tear will always defend its flesh. Wheat aspires to be just like Christ, always. That means they learn, they change, they grow. But a tear will always give excuses to his flesh to stay whatever they want to be. They'll always say, well, God understands and keep doing the same thing year after year. Wheat does not do that. In fact, even the physical wheat must overcome and grow, or it's not wheat, it's something else, the counterfeit. Wheat progresses until it yields. Did you know that? Even genetically, it is not the same plant when it is tiny as it is when it's ready to harvest. Did you know that? It is not. It is not the same. It is not chemically the same. It's not physically the same. But a tear does not want to grow in Christ. They want to stay the way they are. Now, Jesus said something very important in the word. He said, we were once children of wrath. All of us were children of wrath. Let that sink in just for a second. We were all children of wrath. You know what that meant? Hardly any of us, any of us had a heart to grow in righteousness because we weren't thinking about it. Then we reached that age of maturity where we had to give it serious consideration. Then our lives started going in weird directions. Then we had to make more decisions. Now we're at that place where we can either say, well, you know, I'm just take my chances. Or you can have that heart after Christ, which are truly the wheat. You know, you're truly wheat. If you do this, when, when you aspire to be everything the Lord wants you to be, then you have a heart for the Father. When you aspire to be what you want to be, you don't have a heart for the Father. That's impossible. It's impossible. You know, it's a natural thing of us. To, we change, we emulate who we respect, who we look up to, who we want to be like. Do you know that? It happens to everybody. Let me ask you this. Why do you dress the way you dress? Because somebody impressed you. You looked at somebody else and you said, oh, okay, I like that. Okay, I don't like that. It's like a big mall, right? You see someone, and you look at them, and you look at their hair, you look at their shoes, you look at whatever, and you say, ooh, I want to get my hair like that. Ooh, I want to get my top. Nothing is original. Everything we emulate from somebody else, nothing is original. We look at somebody else to get to, to see what we want to be. But how many people are looking at Christ when he did not sit up there and brag about what he knew? How many said, I want to be like that? How many can read the word of God and to see people threaten him and he walks through these crowds that threaten him, trusting him, the living God, say, I want to be like that. I want to walk like that. Let's go ahead and face it. What we do is we look at television. We look at YouTube. We look at the internet. We look at the floor. We look at the ceiling. We look at windows. We look at our clothes. We look in the closet, doorknobs, and everything else. And we say, I want that. I want to be like that. And we emulate people very well. We mimic people. At what point do we have a heart? To honestly say, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be like the Lord was in that instance. I'm going to be like that. Because if you're part of the family, which you are, because if you believe in Christ, you're part of the family. And some of you have looked at Christ and said, I'm going to be like that, but everybody says it's impossible. I'm going to be like that, but everybody says you can't achieve that. Whose report are you going to believe? The report of men that says you'll never become that or the living God who gave us that word that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which report? Huh? The one where men give you limitations or the one where the Lord says, you can do all things through Christ. It's impossible with men, but not with God. What, whose report are you going to believe? And see, that's what it comes down to. You know when the Lord says, subject yourself to the elders? You know that word elders has nothing to do with age in a couple of instances. Do you know that? That meant position is given by God. So if a 12-year-old came up and God gave that 12-year-old position with him, then guess what? What is that? What is that 12-year-old spiritually? An elder, correct? We listen to the world and we think that comes by way of age, don't we? Disregarding what somebody in the youth might say, then we do that. So the Lord Jesus gave us a way. But when we don't follow his way and we aspire to be something in the world, we usurp our authority. Remember, the authority that you have was given to you by the Most High, it wasn't given to you by men. The life that you're operating by in this world was given to you by the Most High. It wasn't given to you by mankind. Man would love for you to believe 
that he is giving you your life. That's not what the word says. You're alive by the will of God. That's why you're alive. You're not alive because you just, you know, evolution says you're alive. That's not why you're alive. You're alive by the will of God. And if you're alive by the will of God and you believe in Christ and you really believe in his story and you really believe that he died for you and took your place, he took your punishment upon him, you really believe that. How could you not aspire to be like the first of many brethren? All of what you have, all of what you are in this world will fade. One day it's not going to exist. Yet we work hard for things that won't exist in the future. Isn't that funny? We don't think of it like that, do we? And because we don't think of it like that, we miss the greater points of things. Like, what are we really working towards? When we communicate with a person, what are we establishing eternally? I'm sure I'm not the only one that will think to do something and they say, no, that, that, what is that? That's temporary. I'm not going to invest my time in something temporary. Who are we to say that God shouldn't have so-and-so on the earth simply because we may be the recipients of negativity from time to time? So the first, I'm telling you guys things that usurp your authority that will redirect your God-given dominion and authority and leave you powerless. And when you're powerless, that's when you become the target of many things even a target of flesh not negative spirits but flesh that's when you become your worst own enemy that's when you can self-destruct that's when you tear down your own temple that's when you start defying everything god said don't do you begin to def defy it and do it anyway that's when you can lose yourself and that leads to a person's name being blotted out of the book of life the falling away remember we live in the days of falling away and Satan is not going to sleep and demons don't take breaks. One small crack and they're going to try and get through it to you. And life can be a thousand times worse than what it is right now, even when you know the Lord. Because the Lord said, if he loves you and you're stubborn and you're rebellious, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. You remember that? Whom he loves, he chastens. If he does not correct you, that means he does not love you and you are fatherless. But if you believe in Christ, he put that belief in you so he does love you. That means get ready for the stripes. And many of you have been complaining for the greater half of your life because you won't yield. I'm telling you what I know because there was a time I did not yield. And I'm telling you, I'm worse than everybody out there. Do you know why? Because I knew better. When I was a young fella, nobody had to tell me about certain principles. I already knew. I knew and still did not do. And I'm telling you from experience, you don't want that. You barely survive it. It will not be fun and games. You'll be at the door of death with no rescue. It'll feel like you're abandoned for years. And it may take years. You don't want that. You have people who have gone through that. And they're begging for you not to take that same course and waste your time. Because if you think life is hard, I'm telling you now, it can be a thousand times harder. Death is a description of a state of being. And you don't want that state of being because there's no escape. There is no death. So you might want to take that out of your minds. There's only a transition into eternity. And when you get into eternity, wherever you end up, you will not escape from. You can either be born alive, because that's what death is. Death is actually birth. You can be born alive or born dead. If you're born dead, you're going to choke for an eternity. And you're going to do that in the presence of all coldness and darkness, of all hate, of all malice, of all betrayal. Everything you hate the most, you're going to be immersed in with no hope of escape. You, do, you don't want those things. Even if there was no fire in hell, I'm telling you something. There are people who have felt the influences of real darkness, and fire is better than that. They didn't feel fire. No, they felt something else that's much worse. You would rather burn to death for an eternity than to feel that. People don't consider things like that because here's the truth. We don't really contemplate our own finish line enough. One day, we're going to finish. Whether we're ready or not, God will say you're finished, you're done. We're not going to die when we are ready. God will dictate that time for us. If tonight he says your time is up, listen to me carefully. You're not coming back to your families. You're not going to talk to your children. You're not going to talk to your parents. You're not going to straighten out that matter you left behind. You're going to be stuck with whatever you have done and whatever condition you're in. That's what you have. You cannot come back and do it again. You cannot. 
See, sometimes we make excuses for our flesh, not realizing the severity of the matter. If Jesus went to the cross and died for us, you better believe it's a very serious matter. Be reminded, nobody gives their life for nothing. Certainly the Son of the living God. It's a serious matter. You know what happens to a person when they stop contemplating the severity of life itself? That it truly is real, that the penalties are real. They give themselves excuses. They waddle in sorrow. Have you ever waddled in sorrow? Listen to me, that means you're, something didn't happen right, so you just sit there and you say, I just need to be left alone for a minute, right? I just need to think about some things. You ever do that? And in that moment, you don't want anybody around you. Listen to me. Suppose you did that one day and an explosion went off and that was the end of you. Suppose you kicked everybody out of your life and in that moment, you said, oh, I can't believe this stuff happened to me and boom, you're done, you're dead. You didn't repent of anything. You were complaining on the way out. See, that's when Jesus comes like a thief. He said for that person, for that, that, e that, that evil servant, he'll come upon him unawares in an hour he's not thinking of. You know what that means? He'll have no time for repentance. That's what it means. You know, every minute, bunches of people leave this earth and they didn't even know they were leaving. We give ourselves time because of our unbelief, because if a person truly believed, that tomorrow is not promised to any of us. If they truly believed that eternity was eternity and that we still have iniquity and blood on our hands, if they truly believed that, not one of us would ever say, I can't work this out, that we wouldn't do that, would we? If somebody announced, if NASA came down and said, there's this huge thing coming, we have three hours, you wouldn't believe that, would you? The first thing you do is jump on the internet, trying to verify with everybody else. And then you would say, what do they mean by three hours? Three hours? until the surface of the earth becomes uninhabitable. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't, nobody would believe it. You would hit the internet and see if it's verified somewhere. And the first verification, you'd pause. The second, maybe give a little more pause. The third, you're gonna start thinking about it. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. You're gonna think about it more and more until you become scared. I'm telling you right now, there would be people so fearful that they would have heart attacks and die. And then when you began to see it with your own eyes, you might become scared. You'll say, well, Lord, I can't go yet because I didn't, I didn't do this. I didn't ask that prayer. I didn't forgive this person. I still need to work this out. I still need to do that. You start thinking of everything you have to do. Why though? Because it would be real in that moment. Only in that moment would it be real. It would be real then. I've been to three, I, listen, I stood beside 360 plus people. About 200 of them were on the way out dying. And in every single case, they were scared to death of dying. Out of the 200 that were dying, at least half of those folks asked me straight to my face, will I really go to heaven or am I going to hell? And they would get nervous. You know why? Because nothing is real until we're facing it. We take things for granted until it's gone. We don't count the cost until the bill comes due. Well, I never thought it would get this bad. That's what we say. Kind of like what they're doing to Putin. The same rhetoric, one nation bragging. Oh, we put him in his place, not understanding what they're doing, not understanding this exact same scenario happened thousands of years ago. And I'm telling you now, the outcome is going to be the same. Right now is the moment. Nothing has taken place. No announcement has been made. And how serious is it to everybody now? In our minds, we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, oh, I got time. You know why people say Putin won't do anything? Because they're saying to themselves, I have time. I don't need to call that person on the phone and let them know they're forgiven. Let them suffer a little bit. They shouldn't have done that to me. I don't need to honor my mother, my father after what they did to me. I guarantee you, when the shadow of death comes, and it will come, there will be many Christians who will not be sure where they're going. They will have no confidence, but will beg the Lord for more time. But for those who in all seriousness and sincerity believe it now, their eyes are opened, and because their eyes are opened, they're helping as many as they can help find the way back to Christ, because no one has as much time as they think. And by the way, the world does not have to be destroyed. A whole nation can be destroyed, and the rest of the world can survive. And we'll likely see the demise, at least of seven-eighths of a nation, will be gone, leaving one-eighth in misery. Things are going to shift people before the Lord comes. People are not going to be in their homes. 
before the Lord comes, the weather is not going to be agreeable. Before the Lord comes, many will hardly be able to breathe outside in the air. Before the Lord comes, men will have cut down most of their neighbors. Before the Lord comes, hardly anybody will stand up for the other. These things happen before the Lord comes. There will be desolations in many places. People will become a rarity. Darkness will be thick upon the face of the earth. The grounds will be unbearable. Refuge will be scarce. The skies will harm and the seas will destroy before the Lord comes. This is before the Lord comes. But today nothing has come. And where are we? What are we settling for? Who's choosing to believe at all now? Because you can't halfway believe. Do you guys know that? You can't halfway believe. You cannot dig half a hole. It's either a hole or it's not. Do you see the point? Let me ask you this. Can a person halfway believe? Can a person halfway submit? No, they can't. You're either submissive or you're not. You either believe or you do not. There is no in-between. We either walk by faith or we do not. We're either standing or we're not. There is no in-between. For a person who cannot make their decision to come to Christ, they've already decided not to come to Christ. Do you see? There's no real fence. You know that, don't you? There is no fence. If a person is on the fence, they've already said no to Christ. But do you see how casual we look at the world as though there is some sort of middle place and there really isn't. You're either for or against. There is no in-between. You're one or the other. There is no mixture. You're either saved or condemned. There is no in-between. You're the redeemed or the damned. There's no in-between. There's only grace, and that's God giving us a little time to get it right. But there is a time when grace, dealing with the time man is given, will be withdrawn. Don't deceive yourselves. And the Bible it says, don't deceive yourselves. Saying God will give us another three years. Don't declare nothing for the living God when he has declared what he has declared already. Haven't you noticed the more time that goes on, the more people play? the more corrupted they're getting. And do you know what God said about this in his word? But if he had let time continue to go, everybody would have been corrupted. But to keep them from that corruption, he'll make a quick work of the end. Can't you all see that? If this world continued, there'd be no redemption anywhere. So time will be cut short. And people don't have as much time as they think you have a moment now. But will you take it for granted or not? Only you can answer that. Nobody else can answer that. Only you can. My hope is that you won't stagnate yourselves by going to sleep, leaving things undone. We all know that scripture, don't we? We're not supposed to let the sun set when we have wrath. In other words, leave nothing undone for that day. Don't leave it undone. Handle what you can handle, but do it now. The urgency is real. The world does not know it. That's also in scripture. That the world will make a gross miscalculation and they will regret that miscalculation that they will say they thought they had more time. You're not of the world, so none of you should ever say that. Only the people of the world will say that. Many of those of the world have become so fast and furious that their hearts are going to stop. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. You know what that means? That means study. They study those things that are coming upon the earth. Those who study the things that come upon the earth, they study by way of evidence that's been disclosed by optics we have in space geological time points and historical time points. I'm telling you now, it's scaring a lot of people. And if you don't have Christ for real, then your sufferings are just beginning. All flesh is going to be proven wrong. Do you know in the Word of God that flesh will never be proven right? You know what that means? All prophecies of the world must fail. Prophecies of the world come from a perspective of flesh, not of the Spirit. And all prophecies of flesh must fail. Folks, the clock is ticking. And people are not aware of just how close midnight truly is. One last thing, I have to leave you with this. When the world does not expect something, that's when it always takes place. Always. Remember that. When the world expects something, I've never known anything to happen when the world expected it to. Obvious things like storms, we can forecast that, of course. I'm talking about an expectation of something. It's when the world does not expect things to take place. That's when the greatest disasters in history have taken place. When people were not ready for them. All of us should take note of that. That's not Satan's doings. 
That's what the Father does. And do you know why he catches people like that? I'll tell you why. If I knew of a specific appointed time, I can by reason of being a fraud prepare myself for that time to act the part when that time comes. But if something happens at a time that I don't even know about, then it's going to catch me in my true state of mind. Do you see that? If we have time to prepare for it, that's acting. If it happens outside of our own timing, when we don't expect it, we're going to be caught in a true state of who we really are. You know what that means? For a person who watches, what does that really mean? When he commanded us to watch, you know what that means? To be in a constant state of preparedness, of readiness. And you know what it takes to be in a constant state of preparedness and readiness? That means you don't give chance to a day. There will be, there, there won't come a time when you're sitting up saying, well, God will give us time. Let me take some me time. You're not going to relax and do something in the world because you have to get something out of your system. You're going to have all sincerity toward the living God and his word. You're going to be about your father's business. In order to be ready always, your mind has to be upon the Lord. You have to acknowledge your life as being in the status it's in due to the kindness and the goodness of the Lord, which means you're mindful of your father all the time. To truly watch is to be ready, is to have forgiven all, is to have conformed yourself to all of what you know the word said to conform yourself to, is to not give sin placement in your life, but to resist it at every turn and to take no chances. You see that? When Jesus said watch, it's almost like a person saying, listen, somebody launched, started a launch sequence of a nuclear weapon. That launch sequence can last up to a year, but we don't know when the missile is programmed to take off. Make sure you have all your gear beside you at all times, because you'll only have a one minute warning. When Jesus said to watch, it's just like that. That means you're not going to take a break leaving anything God commanded you to do undone. You're not going to take a break and let something fester. You're not going to sit there and complain about everything and not be thankful. You're not going to give your time over to that sinful situation, but you're going to stand ready always. And you know what? Those who watch, it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it becomes natural. And when it becomes natural, now you're living a life so different than what you used to live and it's authentic. That's when you don't hold anything against anybody. That's when God is the judge of your life and you need not ever take that position. Because in your heart, you'll say, God will deal with that. That's when you know no one escapes anything they have done. That's when you understand there is no idle word. That's when you don't hold grudges. That's when there's no bitterness in your heart. That's when you're taking it seriously.